So I have to go old school for the oh, well, one. Isaac, is that coming through? You're muted. Oh. I'm muted. Hit the switch. Hit the switch. On. All right. On top. On top. How about that? All right. Well, thank you, Matthew. And uh, it is good to be with you all again uh, this Lord's Day and uh, to bring you God's Word as we uh, look at uh, Matthew chapter 3 this morning. Um, if you would open in your Bibles uh, to that passage in the Math uh, Gospel of Matthew chapter 3, and we'll see what the Lord has to say to us. Um, the latter half of the chapter will be our text, um, but I'll read the whole chapter just to give us context for it. Well, let us now hear God's word from Matthew chapter 3. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of he heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of the one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. But when they saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to be baptized, or to be coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not think to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you, God is able to raise up children of Abraham from these stones. Even now the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you are coming to, coming to me. But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. And when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him, and he knew, excuse me, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Can you join me in prayer, please? Our Heavenly Father, as we come and we get to behold uh, your glory here within this passage, we get to see the action of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all at work here in the baptism of Jesus. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would open our hearts to the truth found therein, and that, uh, Lord, we will obey uh, quickly the call of your gospel, uh, and that we, through the obedience of faith, we would give glory unto your most holy name. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I know many of us have read the story of Jesus' baptism, and uh, it might be actually kind of a puzzling event for many of us as we start to think about um, why Jesus was to be baptized. You know, before we even consider that, though, the baptism, we, we also just think about um, the narrative of the Old Testament and how in the Old Testament, there was a tension which existed about the presence of the Lord himself. In 1 Samuel 6, 
we see the return of the ark, and it comes to Beth Shemesh. And some of the men of that village were curious. It was a Levite village, and they decided to take a peek into the side of the ark. If you remember what happened, the Lord that day then slayed 70 of the men of Beth Shemesh. Just for the mere act of profanely treating God as a toy, as a trick. We think of the two sons of Levi who come and decide that they just got out of seminary and they're going to do a new trick. And they're going to give a, a, a new twist on the offering before the Lord of incense. And they challenged God's anointed Moses and called into question the Lord's regulations. And if you recall then what happened, the Lord consumed them with fire. But then we see the prophet Isaiah, the man who had the vision of the Lord and was undone by that vision in, in chapter 6 of his book. But in Isaiah 64, Isaiah looks to the heavens and he cries out, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. Now this is a call that Isaiah has to the Lord to bring judgment. But also, it is a desire of Isaiah to have the near presence of the Lord. Which can and is a frightful event. The word awful originally meant one who was filled with awe. And it was the awful and dreadful presence of the Lord which Isaiah yearned for. because Not because he was thought, oh, this would be awful. But he would be filled with awe. So there's a truth that we are experiencing here. God is holy, but yet man is sinful. And God appears throughout the Old Testament, but finally, here in the New Covenant, Matthew is revealing to us how a holy God is uniting to man. Not bringing man's sinfulness to himself, but rather redeeming humanity and taking away the sinfulness. We see in the God-man, Jesus Christ, reconciling this problem of a holy God to sinful men. And we see this particularly now as we turn to our text out of Matthew 3. As we consider the baptism of Jesus... And there's three things that I want us to see as we consider Jesus' baptism. First, that Jesus is anointed in his baptism. Secondly, that Jesus is revealed in his baptism. And thirdly, Jesus is established as our representative in his baptism. So what was going on, let me just give a little historical context here. If you remember, uh, John the Baptist was called from the womb to take a Nazarite vow from, from his birth. He was never to consume wine. He was never to cut his hair. He was never, uh, he kind of lived an austere life. A stone was his pillow. Um, he wore um, kind of shabby clothes of uh, fur and ate locust. Uh, he would have been kind of a strange looking guy. Uh, but he was in the tradition of the Old Testament prophets. And in fact, he is the last Old Testament prophet. And he was sent to prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah. And now we see him at the Jordan River performing this baptism. This was coming from um, in the intertestamental period. That is from the time Malachi ends in 400 B.C. to now you had some rituals that developed, and one of those rituals was called mikvah. Mikvah was a cleansing that one would do with water, normally typically applied to the oneself. Now John is bap baptizing, baptizo, the, the Greek word for to, to wash, to submerge, to sprinkle, you know, and these are all these debates that we can talk about mode of how we should be doing our baptism, which we're not worried about today. But John is 
coming and he's offering this cleansing to the people to prepare them for the coming of the Messiah and for why? Why, why did was he baptize him? For the repentance. For repentance to prepare them for the kingdom, coming of the kingdom. And think about John here. He's, he's in the river. He's doing his work. He's preaching. At first he has the Pharisees show up and and, you know, as you heard those, those very direct words, basically, you brood of vipers who told you to flee from the wrath to come because they, they were ingenuine in their repentance. And he's calling them on this. And he's, he's really ministering the word of God and calling people to consider their lives in light of God's holiness. In light of the fact that man is sinful and God is holy. And that there is a need for cleansing of this unholiness, of this sinfulness. And as John is doing his work, he looks up on the brow of the hill where Jesus then descends down from it. And as John's gospel reminds us, John saw him and he says, Behold! The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is who John sees. So John then has Jesus come to him and he says, You must baptize me. So, children. Why do we baptize? Why, why do we baptize people? No? No brave souls? We baptize. Okay, go ahead, Isaac. Uh, it depends if you're Baptist or Presbyterian. Well, okay. Well, why, why do Baptists or Presbyterians baptize? What is the need? Why do we have a need for baptism? We need cleansing. We need cleansing. We're sinners. Okay, children, I'm going to try you again. Was Jesus a sinner? No. Jesus wasn't a sinner. Jesus was perfectly sinless. And yet he comes to John and says, I need to be baptized. And John, John I mean, put yourself in John's shoes, okay? Beginning of Jesus' ministry, Jesus has just left Nazareth out of his father's carpenter's shop he's coming and he's beginning this is the introduction of his public ministry and he's coming to john john supernaturally wrecked because he he hasn't met jesus yet he sees john, jesus off in the distance and he, remember he says behold the lamb of god so he knows who he is in some sense and and the first thing jesus says to him is baptize you jesus no, I need to be baptized by you. I need your cleansing. And uh, so why, why, does he, why does he start this? And so first, let's consider the action that happens when John actually baptizes Jesus. Jesus is baptized, and, and verse 16 said, And behold, the heavens were opened. To him, and they saw the Spirit of God descending on him like a dove and coming to rest on him or to abide on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my well, my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. In the Old Testament, the office of prophet, priest, and king were all began their ministry with anointing. And they would take oil and they place it upon the head of the individual for whatever particular office they were going to execute. Here in Jesus' baptism, we see the same thing here of an anointing that is happening, rather than with oil, but with water. And the reason that we know that this is an anointing because we see the full work of the triune Lord coming to bear in this passage. The voice from heaven, the spirit of the dove descending upon the anointed one. 
and it is a proclamation of the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Now, I might be hard-pressed to say that prophet, priest, and king are all demonstrated here in this passage, but if we take the totality of the Gospels, we see that Jesus executes all three of these offices, and of course the epistles begin to explain this, so we can infer back to this passage that this is the anointing, the prophet, priest, and king, the true offices of Israel being fulfilled in Christ by the blessing of God and his saying, this is my son. So Jesus' anointing work of Messiah, that's what literally Messiah means, the anointed one, begins here in the Jordan River. And we see the Trinitarian expression most visibly back, uh, beginning here also at his baptism. First, let me just talk about his anointing and I'll return to the Trinity. Um, Isaiah 42, 1 says, Behold my servant in whom, whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth just, justice to the nations. Right here in this passage of Matthew 3, we see Isaiah 42 starting to be fulfilled in the, the baptism of Jesus and the anointing of the Spirit for the work that he would do as Messiah. And in this passage, we see the Trinity so well demonstrated. Garrett Dawson, a pastor, says, So the baptism of Jesus marks the first time that God clearly identifies himself to the world as Trinity. All three persons are involved in the baptism. The Son offered himself to the Father for the mission prepared for him. The Spirit descending from the Father to empower the ministry of the Son the Father spoke aloud his enduring love for his Son. In, his, in this one scene, we, we learn that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the Eternal Son has come to identify with us as man and therefore to bring into the triune circle of love. More to be said about that later. So we see God fully manifesting himself here, one God revealed in three persons, so clearly in this passage of Matthew chapter 3. And he is anointed for the ministry of Messiah. Now, he's anointed, but he's also revealed here. He is revealed by the voice of the Father. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. You know, there was a commercial a number of years ago, it was uh, E.F. Hutton, and they would uh, have different scenes of different things, and, and uh, then the person giving the financial advice from E.F. Hutton would start to speak, and everyone would hush and be still. And they'd want to hear what E.F. had to say, because what he had to say would make you some money. Because he was a wise investor. So much more so to those who want to inherit eternal riches shall you listen to his beloved son. This is someone we want to hear. You know, it's interesting if we then flipped over to, to the 17th chapter of Matthew of the, at the Mount of Transfiguration, the same statement is made again from the Father. He says, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him, he adds. So why does the Father add to what he's already said? First, if we think about it, if we hear a voice from heaven, you're there at the baptism of Jesus, and you see him said, this is my beloved son, and I am well pleased. It's already someone you want to hear from. But now the father explicitly says in the transfiguration, listen to him. And this is a, a direct citation or, or you, uh, uh, from Deuteronomy 18, 
when he says of a new prophet that will arise like Moses, then the Lord your God will rise, raise up your prophet like a man, like me, from the midst, from your midst. And Jesus came from their midst. From your brethren, him you shall hear. You shall listen to this prophet that will come and speak the words of the Lord to you. So now we see, as Jesus is revealed, he is one who has come to proclaim the word of the Lord. Another theologian says of, of this, uh, these two events of, uh, this is my beloved son, only twice in the synoptic gospels do we hear the voice from heaven. The first time is at is at the baptism the second time at the transfiguration of Jesus Christ if the baptism signifies and initiates the opening phase of Jesus public ministry the transfiguration apparently inaugurates the next climatic phase namely his death resurrection and ascension Jesus right from the beginning of his ministry is one who is coming as God's prophet to minister his word to us so sometimes though I think we can we can make the mistake and bifurcate or uh, divide up God's word by saying well oh, these are words from the Gospels now those those words from Deuteronomy or numbers or Joel you know they're, they're good words but you know, they're not the words of Jesus. Or I've even heard some say, well, that was Paul's opinion. Yeah. No. Every last word is that which we must listen to. I remember uh, once I was invited to uh, give a, a talk at a uh, uh, high school event this was a number of years ago and uh, um, they wanted me to give a talk on who is Jesus and uh, I'm like okay I can definitely do that I wrote up a little talk and and then and I said well uh, do you have something you want me to say yeah 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 and they sent me a manuscript and I read it and I'm like well I can't do this <laughs> and it was it was pretty bad but uh, I'm like I'm still going in open-minded I'm gonna come help and uh, the first night uh, they, they like at the beginning of the, the, the weekend to take away your watch. I go, okay, whatever. So everyone takes away their watch. Well, they, they gave this little talk on why they want to do this. And, and, and the leader of this group started talking about the good God and the bad God. And the bad God is all concerned about time and he's just really rigid and everything like that. Well, they start, then this person starts to give citations from Deuteronomy and Exodus about the Lord and saying this, this is the bad God and then this kind of new agey kind of things about who God is and so I'm like okay I'm gonna go back and rewrite my uh, talk for tonight and I gave them the next morning Jesus from Deuteronomy because what Jesus loved was God's Word in fact if you flip over to the next chapter when we see our Lord confronting Satan. What does he say to him? The Lord's word is my bread. Every single word is my substance. What God has said, the scriptures say. Jesus did not compromise on this. Jesus didn't look at the Old Testament as a group of fables to, to figure out and metaphor. To, uh, to make examples of, but rather as actual history. He didn't think Jonah was a mythological experience, but rather an actual event which pointed to a greater reality of his resurrection. Jesus took seriously the word of the Lord. In fact, remember he said, don't think I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. No, 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 no. I have come to fulfill them. And this voice from heaven 
this completion of God's word in person of the Lord Jesus Christ says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. In fact, if we think of, and just sorry, this a little side note here, if we think of Luke 24, really it's in the embodiment of Christ when Jesus is on the road to Emmaus with his disciples. He says, all of the scriptures are pointing to me. I am the fulfillment of all of them. I'm bringing all this together. And it is not something to trivialize, but rather something to to make as our substance. Just as if, if God's word was the bread of life to Jesus, how much more so is it to us as his followers? You know, Peter writes of his experience on the Mount of Transfiguration, and he ties it to his own apostolic work. He says, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths, when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain, and we have and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention, as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke by God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit." This, this comes from Peter's own experience as he writes down the oracles of God, tying them directly back to following Christ. So we don't pit them against one another, but rather we see here if this voice from heaven is pointing to this one, Jesus, who says, listen to him. And Jesus says, yes, listen to me. As I have given this to you in God's word. Finally, we see here also in Jesus' baptism that Jesus is established as our representative. If we opened up our confession, we would find in the seventh chapter a statement on the covenant of works, and it says this. The first covenant made with man was the covenant of works wherein life was promised to Adam and in him to his pros uh, posterity, that is those who descended from him, upon condition of personal and perfect obedience. When God created man, he just gave him one rule. Just one. Don't eat from that tree over there. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if, as we then quickly turn from chapter 2 of Genesis, of God completing his creation, and turn to chapter 3, what do we see? The fall. We see now, all, almost, it was almost like a, well, we don't know how, how long transpired between uh, chapter 2 and 3, but it seems like it's pretty quick. Um, and we see the fall of man. We see Adam and Eve entering into disobedience, therefore breaking the covenant of works. Now, when God establishes a covenant, does he, does he just get rid of it? Does he say, ah, never mind? Now, he gives us a new covenant right there in Genesis 3, in God's mercy. He gives a promise that through the seed of the woman, one day will come one who will crush the head of the serpent, but the covenant of works is not set aside. It still holds over us. It's almost like a sword hanging over us. 
that you will perfectly obey the Lord, lest you die. This is why Paul says in the book of Romans, the wages of sin is death. So we have a problem, a contractual problem. The Lord has established his covenant. It will not be broken. What do we do? Well, here, if you remember the phrase that Jesus said to John of why he must be baptized, he says, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting to fulfill all righteousness. This sinless Jesus comes as our representative. In the lush garden, Adam failed. Adam fell under the condemnation of the covenant which God had established with him. But now we see Jesus taking on our humanity, yet without sin, and fulfilling that which Adam could not do. It's interesting, even as we think about then just what happens in the next chapter, he faces down the one who led humanity into this fall. And yet, where in the garden Adam failed, in the wilderness Jesus succeeded. And we see here that he is identifying with us. Gerhardus Voss even says so much so, he says that, God, that Jesus vicariously repented for his people in the baptism. Not that Jesus had something to repent for, but rather he is our representative and fulfilling every requirement which is needed for this to include ultimately his vicarious death upon the cross. And this is why the writer of Hebrews says, for we have a high priest who is not unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Think of that temptation that Jesus went through and yet succeeded. So we've seen how Jesus was anointed in his baptism. We see how Jesus fulfills his uh, uh, he is the proclamation of God's word and that he establishes himself as our representative. But I haven't really directly tied this all to us. So in conclusion, let me kind of bring Jesus' baptism really applicable to, to our own day-to-day -day lives. Um, again, returning to the Westminster Confession, when it speaks of sanctification, it says, this sanctification is throughout. Speaking about we as persons, it's, it's it, it, Jesus, or the, the, the Holy Spirit is cleansing us and the whole man, is, but then listen, yet imperf imperfect in this life, there are abiding still some remnants of corruption in every part, whence arises a continual and irreconcilable war, the flesh lusting, lusting against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. So if you're in Christ, congratulations. You have a struggle. You are in, you are in constant um, turmoil with the flesh. The war, the spirit is warring against us. And this is where we should go back and think about and look on what God has done for us to overcome these things. Rather than looking at ourselves and trying to say, well, how can I win this war, rather it is God who must win this war. And so as we think about that struggle, then we, then we go back and we're looking at this perfect trinity. We're thinking about God as he's revealed himself here. You know, there's some who have thought, well, God created the world because he was lonely. No. God is always in perfect fellowship with himself. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are 
give a perfect love and a perfect fellowship with themselves. But in our justification, even though we have the struggle of sanctification, which God is sovereignly working out in our lives, each one of us, in our justification, we are given union with Christ. Hear what Paul says in Ephesians 1. He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with whom he has blessed us in the Beloved. God the Father, who said, this is my beloved Son, has connected us to the beloved Son and has adopted us as sons. We are joined to Christ. And actually, our, uh, it's nice that our, the reading of the uh, gospel today after the absolution of sin, it says uh, in John 14, but you will see me because I live, you will live also. At that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. Now, God by nature is Trinity, but God, through his Holy Spirit, regenerating the heart, then allows us to participate in this fellowship as, as the Apostle Peter says, we get to partake of the divine nature of God. Not because we become God, but because we get to enjoy this fellowship that has always gone on within the blessed Godhead. Again, I'm not blurring the creature uh, creation uh, distinctive here, but rather I am talking about how God invites us into this wonderful place of fellowship. And this is why in our baptism of ourself, we are baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because not because we deserve to have this, this fellowship, but rather God mercifully stoops down and brings those whom he calls to himself into this fellowship. And we see here in Jesus' baptism, the one standing in the gap, the one bringing us to God, the one that we should listen to and hear his voice and hear the call of, of him who says, come unto me, all ye who are, who are weary, and I will give you rest, resting in the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of those who trust in Christ. So as we think back on the work which Matthew has displayed here of Jesus' baptism, we should then think of our own baptism. And we should recall the mercy which God has shown to us in giving us the waters of baptism. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we now close this time of looking at your holy scriptures, we pray, Father, that we would believe, that we would trust you, O Lord. We thank you, Father, for sending us your Son. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. And we ask, O Lord, that we would continue to look in faith to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And it is in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.